I am very grateful for this evening. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, two quick caveats up front. I'm not here to defend the BBC, although I worked there for a very long time. I left eight years ago and I'm not in a position to defend or justify its actions, especially in the past eight years. I often find when I speak that people expect me to uh, defend it and know all the answers. So I want to make that clear at the beginning. And also through the evening, um, I'm going to use the term media or traditional media. And I want to emphasize that of course, there's a vast range of media. There's state controlled, state owned media. Uh, there's also public service media, such as the BBC, which is governed by a charter, which makes it clear it's accountable to the public, not the government of the day. And then of course, there are many private commercial media. They change stance if they're sold to another owner. Uh, they're usually answerable to their shareholders or investors. A quick example of that, for instance, is the Washington Post, which as you may have heard last week is currently owned by Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon. So he's bought the paper, but it still rests on its reputation from the days of its Watergate investigations when it brought down President Nixon. So I thought that as any uh, rule of communication, the first one is know your audience. So that's why I thought it would be good to have our Mentimeter poll and our question, and Tim, I believe you're going to help me with this, is what is your main source of news these days? So if you can put up the poll, Tim, that would be great. There you go. Everyone should be able to see this slide, which is the results of the poll. But as per the instructions earlier, using Mentimeter, please grab your smartphone and submit your response. It'd be great to get a little cross section of the audience this evening and hear uh, where you guys get your main source of news from. And there are quite a lot on the list, so be sure that you don't miss any before, uh, before you press submit. Any standing out to you so far, Julia? Um, well, I'm, I noticed that um, the one news website shot up straight away. There was about 33% on that in the middle of the screen. And then BBC is kind of around the 25%. Um, no, none so far for ITV Channel 4 or Channel 5 News, which is quite interesting. BBC Radio doing well, 20, 21%. And then a few others, local radio, um, Twitter, 5%. That's quite interesting. 1% um, coming up for Christian media, 3% for podcasts. So interesting that standing out are the news websites. That's, that's quite impressive, actually. Julia, if um, I wanted to submit the BBC News app, would I put that as news website? Oh, good question. Uh, probably, yeah, I'd put it under website, yeah. Okay, so that's yeah. me. That, I, that gets a strong vote from me. <laughs> Absolutely love it. I'm addicted. <laughs> that's great. <clears throat> Yeah, so kind of BBC Radio, yeah, that, I think probably that's it. Is it pretty much, do you think most people have voted? That's so we've got, we've got 95 votes in there. So that's about, that's about half of the people here. We'll leave this poll open so people can submit results as they go through if we want to take a look at it later on. And I'll just remind everyone as well that if you do have questions for Julia at the end of tonight's uh, event, then please submit them using Mentimeter. There should be a little button on your phone that says, open Q&A and you can put in your questions in there and we will moderate those and use them for the Q&A time later on. So Mentimeter will stay active in the background, even if it's not on the screen. Okay, so as you know, the title of the evening is Fake News, Lies and Videotape. And obviously that was a spin on the film title of a similar name. Um, but I thought what I would start to do, because a lot of people here don't necessarily know me, is just give you a little bit of background and I am struggling to move it on. Just needs to press play, Julia, at the top. Oh, haven't pressed play. Well, thank you for reminding me. There you go. Thank you. So, story so far. I started out as something called a studio manager. In my day, they were very unseen behind the scenes uh, in all the particularly radio drama and ra proms and all those uh, radio programmes. Nowadays, they get a credit because of uh, coronavirus, they're usually credited at the end of the programmes, particularly on BBC Radio. But I also wanted to give you a little bit about the background, because I think it's easy to think that we're in a particularly difficult time for truth. And I want to go back a little bit over my career and think about the kind of experiences I've had over all the years. And, and one that came very early in my first year when I was in the BBC World Service newsroom was uh, at the time of the Iran-Iraq war, I uh, took the call on the big news phone that was in the middle of the news, news area 
And there was an, uh, an unknown voice, anonymous call. And I never forget, I was talking to a man on the end of the phone and he was basically saying, if the BBC broadcast the result of a particular battle that had happened that day during the Iran-Iraq war, uh, there was a threat that they were, this man or his accomplices were going to kill our correspondent. Uh, now that was a clear uh, attempt to try and control the news agenda. I'm pleased to say the BBC World Service Newsroom did report the result of the battle and the man in question is still alive today as far as I know. But that's the kind of thing that uh, you get when you're working at the heart of a, a global news story. After a year or so in London, I went down and worked at BBC Radio Solent in Southampton. And it was during the time of the Falklands War. And I watched the ship sail away down the Solent off to uh, the Falklands. But I was due to go back and start working in London. And I was going to be again working in the World Service as a producer. But again, I got a phone call and the colleagues who were expecting me the following week explained that I would have a Ministry of Defence sensor in the cubicle where I will be working to ensure that uh, what the World Service was broadcasting didn't inadvertently put our troops at risk by giving away their movements to the Argentines. And interestingly, at that time, uh, a man who's now famous as Peter, the man who did the swingometer, Peter Snow, he was accused of mere treason for daring to imply that we might not be hearing the full facts about the Falklands War. And the programme Panorama, one of the programmes that went out that time, uh, was described as, as an odious, subversive tra travesty, just because it aired Argentine ministry and anti-war voices. So the BBC has been under pressure over many years. Journalists like me always under pressure. It's not just today. Mm -hmm. um, 92 to 93, I was working in um, Pakistan, reporting for the BBC and the Daily Telegraph. It was at the time of the Afghan Mujahideen War. And I actually had colleagues who were killed by uh, Mujahideen leaders because of what they were broadcasting about that war. Um, in 94, I spent six months working through what I called the summer of Rwanda, where every hour on the hour, I would read news bulletins about what was happening by, in the Rwanda genocide. And you'll remember that was initiated or incited by Radio Milkolin, and it dehumanized Tutsis by, amongst other things, calling them cockroaches. 95 to 6, the Balkans War, interviewing colleagues on the ground uh, from London. But that was uh, fueled that ethnic and religious nationalism that broke out into the Balkans War by President Milosevic of Serbia and some very um, strong speeches, not unlike a sort of President Trump of his time. And then in 97, uh, this was really the big year where we moved from analog broadcasting to digital and things, everything went automated. So before you'd have 12 people putting out a television news, pay, news program, afterwards you'd have three or four people doing the jobs of 12 people. And I was involved in the launch of the BBC News Channel. And that's when they started doing what people complain about quite a lot now, which is filling airtime. You know, when you're waiting for Boris Johnson to come out and stand on the steps of number 10, and you end up having poor correspondents who are just filling, speculating in the absence of any action. They're just saying things for the sake of saying things. You know, one time I remember they ended up talking about the sandwiches that were being taken in and that kind of thing. And um, also I was in Khartoum around the time of the Darfur crisis. And uh, I was also went back to Kabul in 2006 when the Taliban were very much in control. So what I'm trying to give you is a sense of context of history in all of this. Now I'm going to, ah, there we go. I'm going to take up Tim's, Tim's hint. Um, changes that I've seen during that time. So the traditional media, very tight controls, gatekeepers, access for the educated, the elite. I have to say, when I watched um, All the President's Men the other evening, um, the editorial meetings were very much men's agenda. Um, and they were all men in that room when, they, when we watched that film, they were all men sitting around. And the, um, the idea you couldn't be what you can't see. I had no idea I could be a foreign correspondent because um, there were no women foreign correspondents. It wasn't deemed a job for a woman. And the way we reported war and conflicts 
was there was little acknowledgement of the human cost of war, the hidden impact of trauma. Um, and women and children were very much unseen. We, we report a lot more about the, the, the cost of war today. And um, we reported, we were very much telling you what you should know, whether you were interested in it or not, we would, we would actually report it. So sometimes I confess it was quite boring. And one key thing, which is very interesting compared to what we see today, is I remember running up and down the stairs of television center, six floors in the middle of the night when I was on night shifts, because we would have only one copy of a video. So you couldn't distribute it to thousands of people simultaneously. You just had literally one piece of video and you'd have to run around the building with it. And if you were a foreign correspondent, as I was in Pakistan, you would have to book a call via an international operator and you'd wait an hour for them to call you back. So how things have changed in my working lifetime. Nowadays, anyone can report. We all have the tools in our pocket. The problem is we don't abide by the professional standards. And I think we still need trusted guides to separate out the true signal from the noise. So um, this is not new. Uh, again, I'm sorry, jumped on. Uh, our ancestors have been tackling this issue of truth and lies for many centuries. Dean Jonathan, Jonathan Swift, uh, it often happens that if a library believed only for an hour had done its work and there is no further occasion for it, falsehood flies and the truth comes limping after it. So when men come to be undeceived, it is too late. The jest is over and the tale has had its effect. And then uh, Charles Spurgeon, the famous theologian, he um, said in 1855, if you want truth to go around the world, you must hire a train to pull it. But if you want a lie to go around the world, it will fly. It is light as a feather, a breath will carry it. In the old proverb, a, a lie will go around the world while truth is pulling its boots on. I personally prefer this one, which is much more um, which is my colleague. Are we okay? okay. Um, yeah, this is my colleague Amal Rajan. Uh, actually, I say colleague, I've never met him, although I hear him on the radio all the time. This is much more what I think. Truth is hard to find, expensive, and often fairly boring. So, um, we need to agree on a common set of facts today. Uh, we no longer simply interpret facts differently to those who disagree with us. Instead, we're presented with different realities. And the hardest job of a journalist now, said Helen Lewis, is proportionality. So I want to start with a text that came in on my phone last March the 24th, the day after um, I, uh, Boris Johnson rather, had um, uh, announced the, the lockdown for COVID. And I'm, I want you, now you've had a chance to read it, probably. I was going to read it, but um, I'm going to move on. Uh, this is the text, uh, and I want you to think about this and what you make of it. I'll give you a little bit of time to read it. I was going to read it out loud, but I figure that by the time I'm getting my script together, you probably had quite a good chance. I hope, I hope people can read that on the screen. Um, essentially, it's the story of a, um, just in case you can't if you're on your phone or anything, it's essentially the story of how an atheist doctor um, had uh, been working in Lombardy in Italy. He'd been caring for um, people with coronavirus. And of course, we all knew that um, coronavirus was uh, something that was coming. We'd seen it in Italy, but this was a story that seemed to be an amazing tale. Um, and so I'm gonna leave it up, but I'm gonna talk about it just while you're reading it, perhaps. I was very moved by this story. I was already aware that several Catholic priests had died. Uh, indeed, the very same day that this story came out, um, there was a Catholic media reports that a 72 year old priest had refused the CPAP oxygen machine so that a younger person could benefit instead. So my first thought was whether this might even be about that priest. I was just about to post it, post it to Facebook to encourage all my friends about the wonderful thing that God was working through this terrible pandemic. When what I call my 
deep BBC DNA kicked in and I stopped myself. I thought, why don't I just check out this guy and see where this has come from? And the first thing that picked, piqued my interest, and it may have been helped by my name, because you see, I don't think an Italian doctor would be called Julian. He'd be Giuliano, like Marco or Franco. So I quickly looked on LinkedIn to see if there was a doctor called Julian Urban, and there was no sign of one. However, it looked as if there was a Julian Urban who was Romanian, but not a doctor. And so then I thought, oh, well, it must be a Romanian doctor working in Lombardy. That seems perfectly plausible. Um, but there was another thing that piqued my interest apart from the name. And I admit that that's because I've been reporting about the global church for a few years. And it wouldn't necessarily hit anyone else in the same way. And that was the word pastor, because Northern Italy is predominantly Catholic and they don't usually use that word, which tends to denote, of course, a Protestant. They tend to refer to priest or father. So by now I was curious and I decided I'd track back this story to where it started. And I thought it would take me about 10 minutes and I was about to start my real day's work, but about two hours later, I was still scrolling back through Facebook to see who'd first posted this story. And what I did was nothing special, anyone could do it. I didn't use any special tools or software, just my common sense. And all I was doing was tracking this post back in time. And for all I know, there may be a quicker way to do it uh, than just track back chronologically, but that's what I did. I went back from post to previous post. Now, at first I was tracing it through what looked like Italian Protestant Christian Facebook groups. And then before that, obviously some Catholic groups. I don't speak Italian, but I've got a pretty good eye, eye for uh, languages. And all I was searching for was the doctor's name. And then it got interesting because the Catholic groups ran out and I found myself face to face, as it were, with a group that appeared to be based in Belgium that served to connect Italians who were working outside the country around Europe. But the interesting thing was, and unfortunately I didn't keep the details of what I found, this report seemed to have been started by two young men, one in Belgium and one in France, who didn't show the slightest sign of being Christians from the rest of their Facebook feeds. And then the trail went completely cold. So then I checked with an Italian Christian colleague who's actually from Lombardy, uh, and that's probably what I should have done in the first place if I thought there'd be anything more than a 10 minute check. And we both concluded that it was probably fake news from Central Europe. And it was only after she confirmed that, that I noticed a couple of skeptical messages in response to this um, uh, post. And I'll just read a couple of them. Is a man called Marco Leone says, does anyone know who this doctor is and what hospital he operates in? I'd like to make sure this is authentic. Before posting, make sure what you write is authentic. It's the truth that frees, not fake news. And then another post came, Alessandra Campanile. We are believers, but not gullible. Even if the testimony contains partly positive messages, I could say for such a difficult time as this, there could be those who invent Christian love stories. Um, and this is exactly what had happened. This, this uh, message that I had received on my phone um, was indeed, I believe, a fake, fake story. I could be wrong. I, in some ways, I wish I could be proved wrong. But this story then started circulating on Christian groups and it took off easily because of something that you've probably heard before in connection with this kind of issue. And that's what we call confirmation bias. We understand and we see the world through what uh, confirms what we know. So in other words, all these Christian groups liked and forwarded this story precisely because it was a story that they wanted to believe. We wanted it to be true. And what's more, we knew that it could be true. It was the perfect example of showing how God was working his purposes out for good in the midst of the most terrible suffering. The pictures we were seeing from Northern Italy. That's why we knew it to be true and worthy of reposting. And I remember sitting at my desk and thinking, gosh, I must stop this story going further, but also thinking, well, that's not, not actually this particular story is what I'm paid to do. I'm paid to report on Christians in far-flung countries, not Italy. And so uh, I'd already spent two hours on it. And so I didn't start trying to alert people, but I just got back to my day job as it were. However, I really kicked myself when a couple of days later, 
I received the newsletter from actually I was going to I wasn't going to say but um, one a Christian organization well known to many of us, which had chosen to quote this particular story. And so I wished I'd made more effort to alert my net networks, because then at least I would have done my bit to discredit fake news. So if there's one thing I want you to take away from tonight, it's this. Remember that we're all prey to confirmation bias. We believe things because they come from sources that we trust. And while that's often okay, because those sources have earned our trust, we have to be very careful that they don't abuse our trust. Now you could argue that no massive harm was done if many thousands of Christians were misled into thinking a fake doctor had been so impressed by the selfless example of a priest or pastor that he'd returned to the Christian faith he'd been brought up in was a story. But how about if those two young men who started that story were actually paid to make it up? Because we know that's what definitely happened in the 2016 US elections. And that first came to my attention when one day in July 2016, I spotted a very strange headline online. It said, the Pope had shocked the world by endorsing Trump. Now, as soon as I saw that, my instinctive reaction was that it was fake um, because I know the Pope would never endorse a political candidate. However, if you wondered for a moment whether it might be true, the next step would be to try to work out where this report had originated. Now, unfortunately, one of the big issues we have today is the lack of religious literacy in much of our media, which means that outside the major media, most people would not think to check whether this was actually coming from the Vatican press office or not. And if they had checked, they would have seen that it originated from a US site called WTOE5, as it says, which improbably quoted the Pope as saying, that the FBI's inability to prosecute Hillary Clinton for her emails had led him to endorse Trump. Now that explanation should have given it away immediately. And another interesting thing, the site was barely two weeks old. But that post got 100,000 comments, shares and reactions on Facebook. And then in the September before the November election, and remember I'm talking 2016 here, a website called Ending the Fed published a fake story with exactly the same headline. And this time it got almost a million Facebook engagements, which made it the biggest fake story of the 2016 election. Now, the news website BuzzFeed investigated where the WTO website had started, and it found that it was part of one of the world's most ambitious fake news operations. It was a network of at least 43 websites that together have published more than 750 fake news articles. And here's how it happened. Back in February 2016, some investigative journalists in the US noticed there were a whole spate of stories, all pretty identical, that read, so-and-so celebrity is moving to such a place. All these stories were coming from news domains with an almost identical design. In fact, BuzzFeed News identified 342 celebrity moving hoaxes spread across multiple connected sites. And as the scam scaled and hit more communities, real local news websites in places like Texas, Maine, South Carolina, British Columbia even, and many other places tried to stop these stories from spreading. But meanwhile, the growing network of fake sites began pumping out new variations. Male celebrities suddenly had very complimentary things to say about the women in specific towns. Celebrities started getting flat tires in obscure places, naming somewhat obscure locales as their favorite vacation spots and buying homes in unexpected communities. In fact, one of the strangest variations was a series of at least 11 hoax stories claiming that Justin Bieber was going to build a mega church in different places, such as, for instance, Spokane in Washington, Washington State, I believe. So another variation moved away from the specific celebrities and started falsely claiming that big film sequels were being shot in different locations. Father of the Bride 3, a Harry Potter spin-off, a new Star Wars film, a new Pretty Woman. They were all suddenly in production and coming to your town. 
BuzzFeed identified 152 fake news articles claiming major film sequels were being filmed in different locations. Now these hoaxes combine two important elements that help them to spread, location and name recognition. Because many people, and I could be one of them, we saw a story about our town that also included a celebrity or a major film. We couldn't help but share that link on Facebook and therefore we drive traffic to sites littered with adverts. Now, while an analysis of these websites content found that these hoaxes never went hugely viral, what they did instead was manage to consistently generate tens of thousands of shares, comments, reactions on Facebook, which likely led to obviously strong revenue and traffic. And not long after, in July, on, uh, in July uh, 2016 again, Another newly registered site published the exact same story with a twist. This time, the Pope endorsed Hillary Clinton. And the site that hosted it, KYPO6, is no longer online, but it used the same template and language as other sites in the network. And that story did even better. It generated over 200,000 shares, comments, reactions. However, it was not picked up by the mainstream media for obvious reasons. So um, these clone websites were, despite having American names, oops, one back, were eventually traced to uh, Macedonia in Central Europe, where almost half the young men in a town called Velesh were unemployed, but were very tech savvy. At first, the understanding was that these young men were simply lured by the chance to earn huge monthly wages, and they were abandoning any, any ethical sense of right and wrong. But in 2018, finally, people began to realize that there seemed to be a link with the Russian disinformation network, part of which is called the Internet Research Agency. Now, you'll probably remember that Robert Mueller, the former head of the FBI, was investigating Russian collusion with the Trump campaign at much higher levels. Now, I'm not going to go into all of that because it does get incredibly complicated. But um, before we break out in a couple of minutes, I'm going to give you some basic definitions that we can work with. Um, we talk about fake news, but actually, uh, those of us working in the industry decide that actually people like President Trump have debased the term fake news because he uses it, he uses it to insult his opponents or dismiss reports, whether they're true or not. So we prefer to talk about misinformation, disinformation and malinformation. So very quickly, as you can see again on the stream, we all make mistakes. We all get it wrong sometimes. I once prematurely killed off Frank Sinatra when he was very ill in hospital on a BBC News bulletin, and we had to retract because we thought we'd got a good source and it was wrong. That's misinformation. Good journalism will correct that. Disinformation is when people will spread deliberately false, misleading or out of context news. And that's where we get clickbait. Uh, if it's got a grain of truth, maybe about a quarter, it's much easier to believe. And that is designed to be shared. And then malinformation is when uh, people use information to inflict actual harm. Governments, content marketers, corporations use that increasingly. Interestingly, four in 10 Americans are unsure if Facebook, Apple News, Google News, all the aggregators, as we call them, do they even do their own reporting? People don't know where these stories come from. And the, the complication is that the legislation dates back to the 1980s. So there's a lot of ways that people can get around them. Um, now, I am going to, at this point, I think watching the time, um, going to, where are we? Yes, I think um, I'm going to do a very quick bit about um, how we as journalists would check this kind of thing. I won't talk too long about how we used to do it because frankly, the way we used to do it when I started in the newsroom uh, is, is kind of pretty out of date now. But I do believe there is a, a case for uh, the key thing is having the context. Um, if you know the context of a story, you can much better evaluate it, whether it's true or false. And so I think there's a real case for what the Americans call the beat reporter, what we call the specialist correspondent or reporter. These are journalists who work on a particular issue for years and years. They get to know all the movers and shakers. Think of Roger Harabin on the environment on the BBC or Fergus Walsh on health, uh, John Snow on Channel 4 News, Christian Amanpour on CNN. 
And despite Michael Gove and Jeremy Vine saying we've all had enough of experts, I wonder where we'd be now with coronavirus if we hadn't had all these unsung experts that we suddenly need to um, tell us about the, the virus. Wouldn't you rather trust Anthony Fauci, who spent his entire professional life working in public health in the USA? He even grew up in a pharmacy. He's known for his gruelling 16 hour days. Why would I not trust him on COVID? And if I went for brain surgery, I'd want a brain surgeon to operate on me. Someone who's done his 70,000 hours of practice, not a GP who pops in every now and again on a day off to do a brain operation. But the thing about our digital world is that, as I said before, we all have the tools that used to be the preserve of expert journalists now in the hands of all of us. And of course, anyone can tell a story, can't they? And we have the rise of the citizen journalist. Now, I don't want to completely knock them because someone who happens to be in the right place at the right time as an eyewitness to history is someone that the journalists need. Who can forget the picture of the plane that landed in the Hudson River in 2009? There was a moment when Twitter became known because a man called Jim, Jim Hanrahan typed, I just watched a plane crash in the Hudson. And he was 15 minutes ahead of all the local news outlets in one of the most media filled cities in the world. But sadly, the impulse to show and tell what you see in front of your eyes has been hijacked by people who realize the total power and influence that the Twitter sphere gives an individual or a corporate account. And so uh, one problem with anyone reporting the news these days is that they're not accountable. For years, the big tech media argue that they're not publishers, they're only platforms, and therefore they're not at all editorially responsible. Unfortunately, that now seems to be coming seriously under question, particularly as we know after what happened in the United States just last month. And we'll come to that in the second part. Um, but before I, want, before I uh, send you off into your breakout groups, I want to show you something uh, as you think about the issue and that I, as a journalist, when I worked for the BBC, I used to have to abide by these. Now that's 250 pages of editorial guidelines. There you go, I'll show it to you so you can actually see it. It's so well thumbed, it's slightly falling apart. But that other, those are the rules and the regulations that uh, an expert journalist will have to abide by. And yet, um, you know, these days, anyone can put up anything, anywhere, anytime. Um, so two days after the 2020 uh, US election, the ex-chief security officer of Facebook, Alex Stamos, tweeted, this is the most intense online disinformation event in US history. Now, I told you about the fake news articles coming from the Russian-backed farms in Macedonia that went viral four years ago. Well, in 2020, a new disinformation battle was raging, but this time the game had changed. Instead of creating content overseas, a number of campaigns were discovered enlisting US citizens in creating content designed to destabilize the political landscape. One freelance writer from New York State started writing for a new left-wing website called Peace Data, but he soon learned the site was being coordinated by people connected with that Russian internet research agency responsible for much of that disinformation in 2016. And Peace Data's editors turned out to be completely fictional. Their social media profile photos were generated by artificial intelligence. So another disinformation campaign unearthed, this time designed and coordinated entirely on US soil. And then Turning Point, a right-wing lobby group, paid teenagers to systematically repost messages, casting doubt on the legitimacy of the election. And so we come to the 2020 US election result. And okay, so I don't want to get into everything about the US election, but I do want to talk about one aspect which came to my attention when a London friend shared something that had come onto her phone. And it's this, let me see if I can share again. Okay, great. So um, while I was researching this talk, I decided I have to be true to my principles and check out where this particular horrible post came from. And there was a clue in one of the articles that wrote about this post, which was someone's name. And then I checked it out on LinkedIn. Now, of course, I realized that every social media platform can have fake profiles. But in this case, there was someone of that quite unusual name and they seem to be genuine. And what really concerns me is that apparently someone is sitting watching the presidential inauguration 
and they're already convinced about Kamala Harris, an avowed attendee of Third Baptist Church in San Francisco, which she was regularly taken to from childhood. And apparently this poster knows that Kamala has her clutch bag on top of the big Bible that belonged to Thurgood Marshall, the US's first African-American Supreme Court justice. But as we see, and I've lost it there, there we go. Um, she clearly has a Bible, another Bible, a second Bible, resting, a zippered Bible. It was widely reported at the time that she chose to swear in on two Bibles. The second one belonged to the woman, Mrs. Shelton, who often took Kamala in while her own mother was working, and who was in fact the person who first took her along to the Third Baptist Church. So this seems to be a very clear example of someone actively creating fake news and spreading it while betraying their complete ignorance of the facts that would have been easily available if only they bothered to check before posting that comment. Now I took time to, as they say, doom scroll through the feed of this person. And what was really sad was that there were clearly Christians trying to point out that it was clearly a second Bible and also explaining the story, why two Bibles? But mixed in with those more reasoned comments from some Christians, there were also frankly horrible ones. And I spent about 15 minutes scrolling through those comments since the inauguration. And I was frankly shocked at the scale and variety of conspiracy theories. So as I've worked on reporting the global church under pressure for its faith since 2012, I've become aware of the way that the digital space can be manipulated. I used to think that the internet, just like any other tool is neutral and can be put to either positive or negative use depending on the person using it. Just like I used to argue that TV could be used to good effect when you watch good uplifting programs or bad effect when you get sucked into say exploitative programs. But sadly, after a few years of focused work on one area, freedom of religion or belief around the world, I now realize sadly that social media platforms are especially subject to the very basic flaws of human nature and behavior, which as Christians we know exist the primary drivers of money, sex, and power. Now, don't get me wrong, I've met some great people who work for Facebook and other Silicon Valley companies, including some Christians and some ex-colleagues. And while preparing, I discovered someone I've worked with on freedom of religion issues is now trustee of Facebook's oversight board. You might have heard that they reported their first cases uh, and the decisions they took last week. And people, good people like Alan Rusbridger, the ex-editor of Guardian sits on that board. I remember a few years ago watching a TV doc filmed in Facebook headquarters, and I was genuinely impressed by the sincerity and the good intentions of the mostly young people who worked there. They genuinely wanted to open up the world so that people could meet across countries, across cultures, and make the world a better place. But the reality is that, uh, as Mark Zuckerberg said, he wants to uh, ensure good and trustworthy news, but the reality is that they've now admitted that 150 million US users were exposed to fake news. And the other thing is that um, we each, as we know, have our own Bill Truman show reality. We each have our own different uh, story that we believe that we live in, in our own, our own story, as it were. And I watched an amazing uh, uh, film sort of documentary uh, just recently called The Social Dilemma on Netflix. And that goes into this in much more detail, but it basically says the current system is broken and it explains why. And essentially, uh, these uh, big tech companies make our data collection effectively the bank and the algorithms uh, to use our data, the, they're designed specifically to reach, attract and retain us for as long as possible. And I think many of us Christians have been un unaware, um, as indeed I think many of our fellow citizens, quite how we're being gamed by this system. And of course, there are many, many complex factors. But when we look at what happened last month in the US, I think Christians have not had their eyes open to this particular aspect of being misled. Uh, there's a quote from Ed Stetzer, who is at the Billy Graham Center in Wheaton, and I'll read it. For years, a segment of Christianity has sought to reclaim the USA as a Christian nation, 
or at the very least, a nation founded upon Judeo-Christian values. However, they have at the same time witnessed the American culture, and yes, what they see as American elites, media giants, big tech, politicians, and Hollywood adopt a more secular and progressive agenda. This movement made many Christians uncomfortable and drove many of them into news sources and chat rooms detached from reality. So Christians have been part of the disinformation ecosystem. And some research has been done, at the MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. They studied 126,000 stories shared by 3 million people. And they discovered that fake news spread six times more quickly. Now, when you think that President Trump tweeted 30,000 plus false claims in four years, uh, you need to know that 20 conservative pro-Trump Twitter account accounts, including his own, uh, were responsible for 20% of the retweets pushing the misleading narratives about uh, voting. And that's a group called the um, Election Integrity uh, Group. Um, and so Ele Election Integrity Partnership. And there was also a study from Cornell University that showed President Trump was the leading driver of misinformation about COVID between January and June last year. And amazingly, Facebook removed 7 million posts for false information between April and June about COVID, content that promoted fake preventative measures and exaggerated cures. And finally, interestingly, 64% of those who join extremist groups do so led by algorithms. And when you consider that Facebook removed 8.7 million items linked to extremist groups, between April and June last year. That's up from 6.3 million the quarter before. And um, that is quite something. So uh, we, we, time is rushing very fast, but I just want to quickly move on to fake videos uh, and deep fake. Uh, they're getting very, very good. I don't know if any of you saw the alternative Queen's Christmas message on channel four, 3.30 on Christmas day when the Queen appeared to do a dance so that it could go viral on TikTok. It was clear from the context that it was not the Queen, but these fake videos are getting incredibly clever, as we see here from a BBC report. Andrew, if you could play, that would be great. Thanks. It got me thinking about my full-time employees and their ability to survive on $8 an hour in New York City. And foremost in all of our minds has been the loss and the grief felt by the people of Orlando. Most of us don't get our health care through the marketplace. We get it through our job or through Medicare or Medicare. And what you should know is that thanks to the Affordable Care Act, your coverage is better today than it was before. Women can get free checkups and you can't get charged more just for being a woman. To give his employees and together to pass a common there's a bill that would boost America's very, very hard times. Some progress, at least in, within the small confines of the legal community. I think it's real important. Uh, here we go. President Barack Obama, uh, when you uh, giving a speech, uh, make sure you use uh, a lot of pauses. America's businesses have created 14.5 million new jobs over 75 straight months. We are developing technology. Every technology can be used um, in some negative way. And so we all should work towards uh, making sure that it's not going to happen. And uh, even um, one of the interesting directions is that once you know how to create something, you know how to reverse engineer it. And so you can, um, uh, and so one could um, uh, create methods for identifying um, uh, edited videos versus um, real videos. Um, so essentially, I'm also watching the time, and I think we want to have some time for uh, questions, but I'll, I'll jump through. And I've come because we were talking earlier, I've seen some questions, people asking, what can they do? Um, and I want to answer and say, you can engage your brain before you forward anything. I thought of a little analogy, um, mirror signal maneuver. The same applies when you move into the online space. Use your common sense. If something looks odd, question it. Keep across the major UK global news to spot outdated or discredited stories. You'll probably remember that in summer 2014, Mosul was taken over by the Islamic State. It seems that a Christian wrote a very dramatic email, which seemed to sound genuine from the staccato way it was expressed. It basically said, 
IS is on its way and we're all going to be killed. Now this was so dramatic, it started to circulate among Christians, but the problem was it was still circulating about nine months later when the people still forwarding it had no idea that the events it referred to were about nine months earlier. The other key thing I want to uh, impress upon you tonight is that words matter. Alleged is, means that we don't know. Someone is alleging. Reportedly means someone is being reported as. Uh, other phrase might be are thought or said to be. Language and tone used in posts. Is it emotional? Is it manipulative? Does it catastrophize? Images, are they emotional, manipulative, catastrophizing? And especially one that I've seen a lot during COVID, beware anything that comes in and says a friend of a friend, even if it claims to know a doctor, a nurse or a politician. The big tech, as I mentioned, individual bosses are wielding power. Uh, they at the moment have control. People like Jack Dorsey can take uh, Trump off Twitter. And that power should be in the hands of governments who should legislate through democratic processes but they too need careful parliamentary scrutiny. And it's interesting that many Silicon Valley workers are acknowledging that the system needs to be rebalanced. There's an interest growing in how to fund public interest news and media. And interestingly, the Australian government you heard last week is the first to challenge Google. We make our rules for what happens in Australia through parliament, said Scott Morrison, the prime minister. Um, Ofcom recently revoked uh, China television news is licensed here in the UK because it said it was ultimately owned by the China Communist Party. So what else can you do? Well, you can support and encourage Christians into and in journalism. I used to talk about swimming in the piranha tank. You can affirm and buy good journalism. And as you know, there's probably uh, at the moment a crisis of funding in local news. And that's where all the journalists learn their trade. And um, Finally, I want to end on a verse which is over the entrance of Broadcasting House, where I spent many years of my life, and many of people don't know this. It's based on the verse from Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, and it says, the temple of the arts and this temple of the arts and muses is dedicated to Almighty God. It's their prayer that good seed sown may bring forth a good harvest, that all things hostile to peace or purity may be banished from this house, and that the people inclining their ear to whatsoever things are beautiful and honest and of good report may tread the path of wisdom and uprightness. And I'd also um, like to uh, challenge you and um, ask you that you pray for journalists as they carry out their work day to day, because it's not an easy front line, as Mark always talks about front lines. So I'm looking at the time and I see we're probably just as well I didn't run, run through all those slides, but uh, if we've got any particular questions that you would like to throw at me for the last few minutes, that would be great. Hi again, everyone, and hi, Julia. We've got some good questions for you, so I hope you're feeling prepped and ready to go. Should we just dive in straight away? Yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, the top voted question is as follows. What's the best way of talking to a friend who firmly believes in conspiracy theories that are 99% likely to be groundless? Whew, that's such a difficult one. I think that, um, first of all, you, I think you've got to listen. Um, I really do. I think that uh, this, is, this is a tough one, I know. But I think what I was trying to describe about Facebook and um, comments and what I noticed when I was scrolling that person's um, uh, Facebook feed was that one theory led to another and people are going down this particular path and, and it all seems very very logical and so I think what you've got to allow the person is to really express I mean I've, I've been in these conversations and then you just have to look for those points that seem hang on a minute you know if that is that then that can't be that and I think sometimes you will find when you give people time and space you will actually find things that couldn't possibly be true or take such a leap of faith to believe it that it will be you know unlikely and then you just have to 
just, I, th I think this is partly why I spent such lots of time on this evening talking about the way these algorithms work, you know, that, that, that they really are against us. I think preparing has made me realize that the system is, is so um, prone to building and deepening and, as people say, taking people down sort of long trails and, and you know, rabbit holes. So I think the key thing is listen, you know, be respectful, but at the same time, start to try and look for those things that don't make sense, if that makes, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. For the next question, I'm going to hand over to Dave Benson, who's LICC's Director for the Centre of Culture and Discipleship. Dave. Yeah, thanks, Julia. That was a brilliant talk. Um, I want to ask a heart and a formation question. Uh, a number of people in our breakout room noted that they're awash in information, uh, that they struggle to evaluate, and that they're not sure what to do with it, and they just end up feeling powerless. They switch off altogether. So how can we grow in wisdom to discern truth without becoming hard-hearted, untrusting, and cynical? Mm, wow, that's such a good question. I think you're right. I think I think we can all, I mean, I'm a news junkie. You know, people who know me will tell you that I have the, you know, the radio on. But I did notice even the, during coronavirus, the first lockdown, that I was sort of getting almost overwhelmed with information. And so I think what I would say is try and seek out the trusted sources. And I know there was another question I saw, you know, kind of rank them. I mean, it's very, very difficult to rank them because it does depend on people's personal, you know, choices and everything, but try and go for the, the really trusted guides, as I would call it, and then try not to keep taking in everything else, everything else, everything else. And the other thing is, I think, is try and have a limit. You know, I, I quite like Twitter, but I'm conscious that sometimes I can sort of get drawn into it. So I try to give myself a limit and just say, OK, you know, you've been on here 10, 15 minutes. Stop, you know, just just have those boundaries. I was on a Zoom call last last week with a friend and, you know, his child came into the call and she said something like, you know, Daddy, it's been 45 minutes. You know, can I watch the TV now or something? I think you do have to do that with yourself. Another of my family a few years ago, a younger generation, you know, she was talking about being on Facebook for six hours and it was like, no, you know, that's, you know, that's just so not, get, you know, a life. So I think that's the thing is try and try and choose your key things, stick to those and don't get sort of, you know, downloads of downloads of trails. Thanks, Julia. Dave looks satisfied with your answer. <laughs> Knowing Dave, I'm sure he would have many more questions for a follow up conversation with you as well. That'll be for round two, I'm sure. So let's go back to the audience questions. The next one is about how we can best challenge what we might believe to be untrue in a news report. So obviously we don't have access to the kind of media firepower that you do. So as a layperson myself, how, how do I push back against what I believe to be untruth in the news? Um, I think the thing about this is, I, I, you, you warned me this question might come up because I think it came in a bit earlier. The thing with someone, an organization, more and more the good media give you a way to actually contact the journalists in a way that was never true. So for instance, an obvious thing is, you know, BBC emails are bbc.co.uk and then the person's first name, second name, you know, first name dot second name. People on The Guardian will often, you'll see their name at the bottom of an article. They'll often now put their Twitter handle. Um, so there is more, I think there's actually more and more ways than ever before to actually give feedback. And you also see the other thing with uh, the professional journalists, you'll sometimes see they'll be asking for, you know, your, your um, input. They'll, they'll, you know, a classic one is when an event happens, they'll say, you know, are you in the area? Have you seen what's happening? And they'll invite you to respond. But assuming it might be a news story that you've heard on the air or seen or whatever, you know, try and find out who's who's the reporter, who's the editor of the program. At the end of TV programs, you can see, you know, the, the production credits. There are ways of doing it. And just write and say, you know, I, I remember once doing it with uh, somebody when I heard a news story on the, on the bulletin and I just sent a very quick email and said, you know, that's not actually true. And to give the guy credit, he changed it for the next bulletin. Now I know, but that was just very obvious, you know, first name, surname at bbc.co.uk. So try and find out who's actually done it, the, the, particularly the journalist. That's great, thanks. Last question that we've got time for tonight. 
the uh, one that has the next most votes is about the shift in the style of news reporting from what might have been traditionally more objective reportage of facts to what's now seen to be a kind of telling of a story. So how do you think this shift to entertainment based news has impacted the telling of truth? Um, that's a really difficult one because I remember when I was in the BBC newsroom some years ago, we were trying to find a way of talking about the economy, you know, talking about, frankly, quite complex things, you know, tax bills or, you know, changes in the legislation. And so the way people wanted to do it was, was to have a personal story. So now you'll see... Uh, when a, a complex issue, you'll always find an individual who's been affected. And that I've seen that change happen. And the danger is you, you end up so much with the personal story that it ends up quite unusual or individual, and it doesn't actually reflect the vast majority of the people who are affected by that particular um, thing. So I think, again, it, it's kind of, I think you're right. I think the balance has gone sometimes a bit too far. So we care more about you know, some celebrity doing something, frankly, than we should be caring about international news. And I think that, again, is a question of seeking out the places where you do get the, the more serious stories, you do get the international news, current affairs, whatever, rather than always just reading the um, places where, you know, frankly, sort of stories and gossip and, you know, so-and-so has been seen with such and such. Um, I, think, I think we have a responsibility to seek out the, the, there's a all I can say is from my experience there's a lot of serious journalists who are trying really hard to get important stories out there and often they feel as frustrated as I do sometimes when you know it seems like all they want to care about is the latest celebrity and who was on Love Island or whatever so um so I think it's our is our responsibility as much as anything to find the serious journalism if that makes sense. Well, uh, thank you so much, Julia. I suspect we could have gone on quite a lot longer and there's certainly some people who would like to interrogate you further. Thank you very much indeed. I, I'm very grateful that you have survived 40 years in the piranha <laughs> plant. It's um, been nibbled to death by it. Um, I must say that um, in thinking about that, uh, I wonder what everyone has sort of heard and seen and picked up as Julia has been speaking. One of the things that struck me was the contrast in her demeanor and character um, between that and the sort of uh, caricature of, you know, a lifetime journalist in an old dra raincoat drenched in alcohol, um, entirely broken. And what you've not heard tonight is cynicism. That's not what we've heard. What you've not heard tonight is hopelessness. What you've not heard tonight is um, any sense that there isn't a way forward or that if you like, um, the fight is worth fighting. Um, you've heard somebody who's essentially at peace, it seems to me, despite the fact of being in really one of the most difficult areas of journalism in the world, which is trying to defend people who are being persecuted and killed. Somebody who's heard the most horrific things and hears them every day. So I suppose one of the things I just want to encourage us with is, um, and to thank you for Julia, is the joy of the Lord that shines through you and that you've brought that to us this evening, as well as being, you know, a clear, warm, purposeful, careful guide, um, using your experience very helpfully for us all and making me uh, more grateful to pay the license fee than perhaps I was an hour and a half ago. <laughs> So thank you very much indeed for that. It's been an absolute pleasure. 